I am Uriah J. Fields. This lecture I'm about to deliver is in this book, My Soul Song by Uriah J. Fields. The title of this lecture is The Four Greatest Presidents from the Black Perspective. The Four Greatest Presidents from the Black Perspective. During the first 240 years of the United States, there have been 44 presidents. Some of them have been mediocre, some are Mary, who at least were merely status quo keepers, and others who made a positive difference and moved America toward becoming a more perfect union. In this lecture, the primary focus is on the four greatest presidents who contributed significantly to black Americans acquiring liberation and more freedom and justice during their presidency are simply stated toward enjoying rights and privileges enjoyed by white Americans. Let's look at names for black Americans. Before discussing these presidents, a discussion will focus on names blacks have been called and indicate which ones are appropriately used when referring to the ethnicity or race of that group of people who are descendants of Africans who were enslaved in America. At present, there are about 40 million black Americans, constituting 12 and 5, 10 percent of the total population of the United States. Two generations ago, James Baldwin, a black American, published a highly praised and provocative book titled Nobody Knows My Name, a book that addressed the names and namelessness experience of blacks. Now, as then, Americans of African descent have often been nameless or misnamed. And apical truth of this is expressed by Shakespeare in Othello. And he says, good name in man and woman, dear my Lord, is the muted jewel of their souls. Who steals my purse, steals trash, tears something, nothing. For mine, tis his, and has been slaves to thousands. But he that filches from me my good name, robs me of that which not enriches him, and makes me poor indeed. Harvard Thurman, a theologian, captures the essence of a name and namelessness in the statement that I'm about to read from his book, The Inward Journey. And I quote, it is a strange freedom to go nameless. The name marks the claim a man makes and stakes against the world. It is the private banner on which he moves, which is his right, whatever else be ties. The name is a man's watermark above which the tide can never rise. It is his announcement to life that he is present and accounted for in all parts in the quotation. During the nearly 400 years Africans and their descendants have been in North America. That includes 244 years when they were slaves and nearly 100 years when they were segregated, discriminated against, and disfranchised eyes. They have been called many names by white people. Included were derogatory and degraded names, not the names of their African progenitors. And ancestors. 
Before presenting the name, our names including those I will use in this lecture, I want to reflect on an encounter I had about names for black Americans in 1994. Henry Louis Gates Jr. published the book, Colored People. Reading this book, I was impelled to write a letter of protest that was published in the Los Angeles Times under the caption of Names and Times on June 12, 1994. And this is my letter. The book Colored People by Henry Louis Gates Jr. reviewed in the book review May 8 is a disappointment to black Americans. It is unthinkable the descendant of African slaves and chairman of the Department of the Afro-American Studies at Harvard University would in the 90s write a book in which he says to his two daughters, in your lifetime, I suspect you will go from being African-Americans to people of color to being once again colored people. I don't mind any of the names myself, but I have to say that I like colored best in a quotation. Included in my letter to Professor Gates was this message intended as well for his daughters, Maggie and Lisa, whose names appear in the preface of his book. And I quote, while there may not be much hope for changing the mind of Papa Gates, I would like for your daughters to know that one, Papa Gates does not know best in this matter of your true name, and two, your true name is American of African descent. After Gates received a letter from me in which I expressed my objection to us using the name color and a copy of my letter to the Los Angeles Times, he sent me this letter of reply. Harvard University, July 11th, 1994. Dear Mr. Fields, thank you for your letter. We Americans of African descent have expended much energy over the years determining what we should be called. There is, as we both well know, a valid reason. The ability to determine is to exercise a measure of control and we always stand in need of greater control over our own lives and destinies. Various names have waxed and waned through history and will, I'm sure, continue to do so. I appreciate the fact that you are contributing to the debate. Sincerely, Henry Lewis Gates, Jr. It is gratifying for me to know, however, that Gates has since used the term African-Americans and Black as can be found in the book, The Future of the Race, that he co-opted with Connell West. Blacks were call, calling themselves various names by the time Afro-Americans gained limited acceptance. I don't think the popularity of the Afro hairdo helped to make the name Afro-American acceptable. The name African-American surface, or that is African-American surface, it first appeared in the poem, I Can, by Johnny Duncans that appeared on the 1987 Black History calendar, while it remained in 1987. However, I had used the name earlier. It was Jesse Jackson who in 1989 let a heightening race consciousness advocacy, pushing the term African Americans as the appropriate name for blacks and non-blacks to use to identify the ethnicity or race of black Americans. Some other black leaders joined Jackson in his advocacy, but not all black leaders. I recall a popular black preacher 
E.B. Hill of Los Angeles, who was the favorite black preacher for white Southern Baptist congregations, and the Billy Graham crusade denouncing blacks for wanting to cease calling themselves Negroes while watching, or while he was preaching on Trinity Broadcasting Network, he said, uh, and I quote, my mama was a Negro. If that name was good enough for her, it's good enough for me, end of quote. He added, and I quote again, I am a Negro, end of quote. To make it somewhat palatable, I suppose for blacks, he added, and I am a child of God. But before his demise a decade later, I heard him use the term African-Americans and black. Although the name I prefer blacks calling themselves is American of African descent, I accept the name African-America as being legitimate and an appropriate name for blacks to call themselves, a name they gave themselves. In my book, Free at Last, Prescription for Black Equity by Uri J. Fields, published in 1986, a year before the Black History Calendar was published, and three years before Jesse Jackson advocate advocacy for blacks to call themselves African American, I stated, and I quote myself, a brief word on the term black is in order. African American is the correct term to be used when referring to the nationality of a black American citizen. However, the term black, when capitalized and used as a noun rather than an adjective, is an appropriate name, even prefer, especially when the intent of the user of the term is to acknowledge an African American's encounter or relationship with white racism. The term black, the office of white, accurately describes the condition of a black person living in white America and the nature of his correct response to his condition and to white racism. In this discussion of lecture, however, white will also be used as the appropriate term to be applied when referring to a white American, especially in the racial or racism context. Over the last quarter of a century, my terminology regarding the appropriate name or names of Americans of African descent to use have not changed. In this discourse, I will use the term black when referring to a black American of African ancestry and white when referring to a white American or uh, Anglo-Saxon. European established colonists in North America. Before the 1492 voyage of Christopher Columbus, that inaccurately refers to the Columbus discovered America, which he never discovered, there were an estimated 10 million Indians, indigenous people living in what is now called North America. Columbus also named the indigenous people of the American Indians. Eurasianism disease, such as smallpox, influenza, bubonic plague, and pneumonic plague, devastated indigenous people who did not have immunity, as did whites who brought them these diseases. Many others were killed with a gun that was superior to the Native Americans' bow and arrow. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, in 2010, the Indian population in the United States was 5.2 million, including 2.9 million in all states other than Alaska, which has an Indian population of 2.3 million. While the decimation of Indians were taking place and Africans being captured by Europeans and enslaved in America, Portugal and Spain were engaged in exploration of the Atlantic Ocean and the New World. 
Portugal explodes South America and claim Brazil as a colony. Portugal was also engaged in the slave trade, as was Spain, and in 1513, the Spanish conquistador Ponce de Leon set foot on what is now St. Augustine and claimed the territory for Spain, which he named La Florida. But Spain had not established a permanent settlement in the New World when the price of English settlements called Virginia was established in 1607. The first representative assembly in Virginia was held in 1619. Other colonists followed Massachusetts in 1620, New Hampshire in 1623, Maryland 1634, Connecticut in 1635, Rhode Island in 1636, Delaware 1638, New Jersey 1664, New York 1664, North Carolina 1663, South Carolina 1663, Pennsylvania 1682, Georgia 1732. These colonies became known as the 13 colonies that existed prior to the existence of the United States. Although Vermont is located in the New England region of the northeastern North America, it was never claimed as colonial, colonial power. It was considered part of French North America. At the beginning of the French and Indian War, 1754, the total population of the colonies was 1,165,000 whites and 260,000 colored. The United States was formed during the Revolutionary War of July 4, 1776. Great presidents, but not for black people. So now the focus is on presidents who were great as evidenced by their accomplishments. Below are three great presidents, but who were not great presidents and so far as having contributed to the advancement of black people. They were slaveholders. However, to reiterate, because of their achievements, they are presented here as great presidents. No, they were not friends of black people. To the contrary, they were enemies of black people who considered them to be chattel. And these presidents saw George Washington, 1789-1797, the first president of the United States and commander-in-chief of the Union Army. He had been a leading commander during the American Revolutionary War. He is called the father of this country. He owned slaves. Thomas Jefferson, 1801-1809, the third president and commander in chief of the armed forces and the principal author of the Declaration of Independence. He oversaw the vast Louisiana purchase of territory from France, 1803, and sent the Lewis and Clark expedition, 1804-1806, to explore the New West. He owned slaves, and according to the most reliable source and DNA, father of children was Sally Hemmings, a slave at Monticello. James K. Polk, 1845-1849, the 11th president and commanding chief of the armed forces. His expansion led the nation to a sweeping victory in the American-Mexican War, which gave the United States most of the present Southwest. He oversaw the opening of the Naval Academy and the Smithsonian Institution, the groundbreaking for the Washington Monument, Mexico Sea, New Mexico and California, 
of $15 million, Texas re annex and Oregon reoccupy. It is important to indicate that slave labor enriched America far beyond the age of a new nation, enabling her to accumulate wealth greater than many long established nations. As a result of this, America was able between 1800 and 1867, 18 years to a fair. In 1803, the Louisiana Purchase from France for $15 million. In 1819, the Florida East and West Purchase from Spain for $5 million. 1848, purchase from Mexico, the Mexican Secession following the American Mexican War for $15 million plus $3.25 million in assumed claims. And in 1867, the Alaska Purchase from Russia for $7.2 million. Now, according to the United States Census Bureau of 1860, the United States population was 31,443,210, of which 27,489,561 were free people, and 3,953,760 uh, were slaves. Two years later, the beginning of the Civil War, the slave population had increased to 4.2 million. It is important to note that Spain, France, Mexico, and Russia selling these lands is somewhat like you or me selling someone the Brooklyn Bridge that does not belong to you or me. The Brooklyn Bridge standing on land and over water that does not belong to the so-called owners of the Brooklyn Bridge, if indeed they were are really the owners. Now let us turn to the four greatest presidents for black Americans. I think this can be appreciated better now after having listened to what has already been presented. The four greatest presidents of the United States from a black perspective are the four greatest presidents, not only from a black perspective, but from a moral perspective and for their contribution to America. However, be that as it may, they are definitely the greatest presidents in the minds, hearts, and experience of black Americans. And they are Abraham Lincoln, 1861-1865, the 16th president and commanding chief of the Union Army. He signed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, aimed at abolishing slavery. However, it would not become effective until after the Civil War, 1862-1865. The 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, adopted on December 6, 1865, abolishing slavery. Lincoln was assassinated. He paved the way for passage of the 14th and 15th amendments. The 14th Amendment that was ratified July 9, 1868, it was first intended to secure rights for former slaves and it provided a broad definition of United States citizenship. The 15th Amendment ratified February 3, 1870, provided that governments in the United States may not prevent a citizen from voting based on race, color, or previous conditions of servitude, that is slavery. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 1933-1945, was the 32nd president and commanding chief of the U.S. Armed Forces during most of World War II. He issued Executive Order 8002, June 25, 1941, to prohibit discrimination in the national defense industry. 
the order established the President's Commission on Fair Employment Practice with the officials of production management to investigate violations and take steps to regress grievances. Despite the order prohibiting any government agency, including the armed forces discriminating against Blacks, the Marine Corps and Navy remained all white until 1943. However, Blacks did advance as a result of the president's effort and that of his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor resigned from the Daughters of the American Revolution after that group denied Mayor Anderson the right to use the Washington Constitution's Hall in 1939. She helped arrange for Marion to give a concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. E.G. Nixon, who paid the bail for Rosa Parks to be released from jail, talked with the First Lady, Eleanor, led to establishing a USO for Black military families in Alabama during World War II. Nixon, a porter, showed me a photo of himself and the First Lady posing together. Nixon, this writer, Uriah J. Fields, and Martin Luther King Jr. were founders and officers of the Montgomery Improvement Association that conducted the Montgomery Bus Boycott. Harry S. Truman, 1945, 1953, was the 33rd president and commander in chief during the last part of the World War II, that is from April 12, 1945, the day of President Roosevelt's death until the end of the war, when he became president and German surrendered on May the 8th, 1945. And after the bombing of Hiroshima on May the 6th in Nagasaki on August the 9th, the surrender of Japan on August the 15th, 1945, to end the World War II, Truman formed a Civil Rights Commission in 1946 and issued Executive Order 9981 on July the 26th, 1948, that abolished segregation in the armed forces. It was not until the start of the Korean War in June of 1950, however, that I, who had enlisted in the army in March of 1948, was placed in an integrated company of soldiers in the army. At the time, I was a chaplain's assistant in October 1948, when Truman was on his campaign train whistle to I and a few other soldiers stationed at Fort Meade, Maryland, were privileged to hear him speak and shake hands with him when his train stopped at the depot in Baltimore. Lyndon B. Johnson, 1963-1969, was the 36th president and commander in chief during the Vietnam War Regardless to how people felt or feel about the Vietnam War, Johnson's contribution to advancement of Black Americans in particular, and all Americans in general, was remarkable in magnitude and unmatched by that of any other president except Lincoln. Johnson's action made the words segregation forever spewed out of the mouth of a rabid segregationist George Wallace, governor of Alabama, during his inaugural address as governor of that state, a lie, notwithstanding the fact that his words became the rallying battle cry for people of Alabama and throughout the South who opposed integration and civil rights. Of course, Johnson had help in accomplishing the civil rights feat that are best illustrated by his statement, or this statement. Harry Belafonte said that during the early months of World War II, A. Phillips Randolph, found then president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, met with President Roosevelt in the White House. 
and her ITM to eliminate racial discrimination in the defense industry. The president listened intently to him for 23 minutes. And then Roosevelt said, Randolph, make me do it. He was not being defiant or opposing what Randolph asked for of him. He was saying, encourage your people to take action that will make it possible for me to do what you have asked me to do. The point is, people engaged in the civil rights movement on which Martin Luther King Jr. was the chief leader, created a climate through protests, marches, advocacy, violence, yes, and deaths of protesters that made it possible for President Johnson to convince enough people in Congress without the support of Southern Congress persons to enact civil rights laws that would trump state rights laws that had deprived blacks in the South of their civil rights since the Reconstruction. Civil Rights Act of 1964, signed by President Johnson on July the 2nd, 1964, banned discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin in employment practices and public accommodations. Voting Rights Act of 1965, signed by President Johnson August the 6th, 1965, suspended poll taxes, literacy tests, and other subjective voting tests. Within months of the passage of this act, 250,000 blacks had registered to vote. I recall how difficult it was for me to register to vote in 1954 in Montgomery, Alabama, after being discharged from the army during the Korean War. However, I did register to vote 10 years before the Voting Rights Act because of my courage and my perseverance. At that time, Lyons County, that adjoined Montgomery County, had a black population of 65% but not a single black voter in that rural county. And after I left Alabama in the early 60s, Stokely Carmichael, known for his famous Black Power Declaration and some other civil rights protesters, spent a lot of time empowering people in Lyons County. His Black Power Proclamation became a rallying cry for years prior to the enactment of the Voting Rights Act. Civil Rights Act of 1968 was also signed by President Johnson on April 11, 1968, exactly one week after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And during the race rights across America in the aftermath of King's death. Colloquially and accurately, the act is commonly called the Fair Housing Act. Before this act became law, there was widespread discrimination in housing throughout America, north, south, west, and east. California was one of the few states that had a law banning discrimination in housing called the Unruh Civil Rights Act, 1959, bearing the name of Jesse Unruh, who was Speaker of the California State Assembly from September 1961 to January 1969. The act covered arbitrary and intentional discrimination and mandated the payment of up to three times the cost for damage in amounts of not, not less than $250 in an attempt to strengthen the unruh civil rights law. Assemblyman William Byron, a black legislator, sponsored the California Fair Housing Act in 1963. It was one of the most significant and sweeping laws protecting the rights of blacks and other people of color to purchase or rent housing and real property. It required violators to pay $1,000. Blacks today, and a look ahead, reflections on the past and a look at today 
and the future. Briefly, blacks today, more than ever, have the law on their side. This did not exist in America to the extent it does prior to President Johnson signing into law the aforementioned three civil rights acts in the 1960s. To reiterate, it is my conviction that President Johnson has done more, has done more than any other president except President Lincoln to advance freedom, justice, and equality for black people in America. This message, and I repeat, is also in print in my book here, My Song Soul, published by Amazon Kindle. I want to close singing, God bless America. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies to the ocean, white with foam. God bless America. My home, sweet home. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her, by my side her. Stand beside her, stand beside her.